I'm Anthony Kovic, and you're watching LeaderCast. And today I have Allison Arngrum. She is an actress and has won many awards, but one of her main awards is Young Artist Award, Former Child Star Lifetime Achievement Award. She's also best known as Little House on the Prairie. Thank you for being on, Allison. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You know, it is um, a lot of people look at actors and actresses as very important, doing a lot of stuff. How does that go with, you know, being a child actress at that age? You know, what do you tell us, you know, today's people growing up as, as a young actress or a young actor, what is it like to do these kind of roles in Hollywood? Well, being a kid actor is very hard. I can't recommend it really for, for everybody. People say, oh, I want to be in show business when they're like little kids. And it's like, maybe you do, maybe you don't. And parents say, oh, my child's very talented. And I always say, well, let them take classes or let them do theater or something first, see how they like it. Because I was sort of born into it. My whole family were in show business. My mother was the voice of Casper, the friendly ghost. She was the voice of Gumby. She was Sweet Polly Purebred Underdog's girlfriend. And Davy of Davy and Goliath. My father was a manager, worked for Liberace and Debbie Reynolds. So it was a show business family. Everyone was an actor. I, I thought everyone I knew was an actor. So it was a little more normal for me to start working as a little kid. But even if you think you like acting or performing, you're on a set with hundreds of people. And there's a whole crew and there's lighting and there's directors and, and you have to hit the mark and you have to be at know your dial and you have to do your thing and you have to and you have to be able to change it up and take direction and work with other actors. And these aren't things that all children want to do or are psychologically cut out to do. It's a certain kind of personality that can do this sort of thing. So I apparently had that kind of personality. Um, I started working, you know, when I was five, six years old. Now, I was very lucky. I worked quite a bit as a small child. I did a movie when I was 10 and a bunch of TV shows and commercials. And to tell you how brutal the business is, at 11, I wasn't working a lot. And my father actually sat me down and said, you haven't been working much. You know, many child actors stop working as they go into adolescence, 11, 12 years old, which is true. That's another thing. You start working as a kid, you might stop working as a teenager. And he said, many people never work again or they don't work till they're an adult. So I was technically, my career was over. I was washed up at 11. And then, of course, I got Little House in the Prairie when I was 12. <laughs> so I always tell people Little House was the comeback. That was my first comeback role. Um, so I was very lucky because Little House ran for, well, a total of nine years. I was on for seven. So I started at 12 and I was 19 by the time I left the show. So the difficult period for any child actor in their career, both psychologically and career-wise as a teenager, I was locked in to a steady job. So that was that was a real stroke of luck that I got on Little House on the Prairie, and it's not necessarily the case for most child actors. So it's a very hard business, very hard work, and some people are cut out for it. That, that is their personality. They are the type of person who will succeed and will enjoy that kind of work. Many people are not. Many people are very talented and they enjoy performing, but the whole rigors of television is just is not for them. So. So when it comes to when you're a child actor or when you your role is done on a particular set, you know, you're pretty, you're pretty much retired unless you have something else happening in your life that that can keep you going because the next role could be a year from now, it's nine months from now, or five years from now. Absolutely. You know, you hear about, we'll say, actors where they got paid a lot, but what if they only did two movies a year? If you only work a couple months out of the year, that's kind of, And for kids, yeah, they could say, wow, it's great. You did three movies. Yes. And then I didn't work for, you know, six years. People don't, they stop working. It's a teenager. So it's very difficult for so some kids. And if they think it's going to go on forever, they might work like mad at like six, seven, eight years old and then stop at 12. And unless they're prepared for that, that can be a very difficult period. What kind of advice do you have for parents that are training their children, uh, especially at the, at the younger ages, like yourself? You, I mean, you have a family that's built into the, the movie business, the show business, and you had systems going on. What did you do when it's like your off time? Well, I luckily stayed in school, and that's another thing that was really smart. Um, I was going to regular old public school with my friends, who I knew since we were kids, and there was a group of kids I started hanging around with in like the third grade. And through elementary, and a lot of them, we went to the same middle school, junior high, into the same high school. And once I got Little House, could, I could have switched over, gone totally tutors in public school, because we had tutors on the set. You know, on the set, you have your three-hour school break, and it's like glorified study hall, and you do your homework. But 
when you go back to school, some people say, well, I'm going to just homeschool, I'm going to get a tutor, or I'm going to go to a very fancy private school now. Cause I'm not sure. I stayed in the same school, which was actually smart, because then I kept the same friends that I'd known since I was eight. So I had that, no quote, normal life, that sense of normalcy and continuity. While when I was off the show, I was back with people I knew. My whole life wasn't turned upside down. I had that to keep me going. So I went to school. I went to regular school with regular people, which is probably one of the smartest decisions that I and my parents actually made. Now, when it comes to the Little House on the Prairie show, you know, what is the, you know, the number one thing that you remember best? What's the number one story that kept you going that, that, that comes, that, you know, that makes you feel great about your work there? Well, I mean, seven years, obviously a lot happened. Um, well, some of the things that happened is, is that we had a really great working relationship. A lot of the actors on the show, we're, we're still all talking to each other now. In fact, most of us are still talking. We're just, we're on the phone with each other and we're texting and, and we're all Facebooking and tweeting and Instagramming. And we're still in touch, which is unusual. Most TV shows within two years, half the actors never speak to each other again in Hollywood. But we all talk to each other still. And that was interesting. We had a relationship on the set that no matter what was going on, we all were so dedicated to doing the show that we got along. And we had Michael Landon. Michael, of course, Michael Landon was writing episodes, directing episodes, producing the show. So he was overseeing everything. And so his work ethic sort of pervaded everything. And I think everyone who grew up in Little House has a really great work ethic today um, for everything they're doing. They've all gone on to some kind of success. And we, we joke about that you don't see any of us, you know, on TMZ, you know, no arrests, no convictions, cast a Little House. We all sort of have our act together. And I think it's that work ethic. And we're able to look back at the show and be proud of what we did. I mean, it's still running in like 140 countries and it's streaming on Amazon. It's the never ending thing. But some TV shows in the 70s they were cute but if you're a kid actor you look back and you go well it was cute but it was kind of silly it was kind of dumb and you feel weird little house was we shot it like we we're making a movie it's a really good show with good writing and good acting and you can look back at it as a child actor and say oh well all right well that was pretty good and and we were held to a very high standard so i think that's you know gives us a lot of you know, self-esteem when we look back at the show so you think the relationships you know kept you guys together kept you guys busy and 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 continue to maintain that the sanity of life outside of the you know the you know the rotations of hollywood glamour and you know clubbing and partying and all the things that go with that become a problem so relationships is really important especially when you're a child actor I think so. I think it was also helpful because there were so many kids on the show and a lot of the child stars I've seen who had extreme difficulties often were the one kid. It was like a movie with all adults and the one kid, a TV show, all adults and the one kid. And often then they're put in a position where they're just hanging around adults all day. There's no one their age and they're not going to the regular school. And they tend to get more isolated and have difficulty going through the normal developmental phases. Whereas with Little House, we had this gang of like 30 kids and we hung out together. So we had people to talk to in our age group. We weren't just living in weird adult world, you know, 40 year old midget land. So we had that. And then because Little House and the image it had and the fact that we did talk to each other, there was sort of a feeling to uphold that even when we got older, even when we were like in our late teens, early 20s and, and were like clubbing, there was a sense of not going berserk. You you knew you had to go to work on Monday and show your face. <laughs> you know you had to show up and say good morning, Michael. And you couldn't, you know, you just didn't feel right like going out and passing out in the street and making a fool of yourself. You, you know, you had something going. Uh, you had, you know, something to lose. You had a reputation. You had a standard. You had a work ethic. You had something to think about. So I think that did sort of restrain us in many ways and caused us to be more focused on our work. Now, when it comes to the first job you've had, how did you end up on the first? What, what was the first job? It was, a, was it a photo shoot, an acting role, TV commercial? First thing would be, I think, was the Hunt's Ketchup commercials, the first one. Uh, Hunt's Ketchup. And it was really cute. It was, a, it was black and white. That tells you how old I am. Um, it was a series of commercials of kids trying to put a tomato in a bottle. And, of course, I, in my case, I was trying to squish it and the tomato breaks. And I'm trying to push the tomato, and it's I'm wearing this cute little white outfit, and it splattered all over me. And I was just like, 
I it was it was made for a great shot, made for a great commercial. Of course, a, a, a typical me. They said, "Is there anything we can do for your little girl?" And I said, "Yes, get this damned tomato juice off me." Like I was Betty Davis at six years old. Um, but yeah, it, the hunt, the cute little Hunts ketchup commercial. There was a show called Juvenile Jury. It was kind of like the Art Linkletter um, kids say the darndest things, and I was on that like several times. It was like being Kitty Carlisle of the third grade. And I, I was on Juvenile Jury. I did a lot of commercials. I did an episode of Room 222, which was huge at the time. And I did a movie called Throw Out the Anchor with Dina Merrill and Richard Egan. Um, it was kind of a cheap version of the movie Houseboat. It was the Cary Grant, Sophia Loren film Houseboat. This was sort of the, the cheap, like, knockoff version of that. But I did get to go to Disney World, and I did get to make a feature film at 10. So that was pretty cool. And then uh, and then I amazingly I I actually auditioned for the role of Laura and the role of Mary because I think everyone did. And I heard they were making this show Little House in the Prairie and I went and auditioned for Laura and I didn't get either of those and then I thought I forgot all about it. I thought well that's done. And then they called back and said no, you're auditioning again. I said I thought we did that. They make that show already. And they said no, now it's sold they're casting the town. I didn't know there was a Nellie Olson. I had no clue in the world. I hadn't read the books. And I got there, and I, I said to my father, this is not a normal part. This girl, this girl's a, a bitch. She's terrible. She's awful. And I read it for my father, and he started laughing, and he said, don't change the thing. You go in, you read it just like that. Don't even look at it anymore. Don't rehearse it. Don't do anything. And, that, yeah, that's how I got Nellie Olson. <laughs> now... You you've played you've played other roles like um and like on other shows like um uh, like Love Boat. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about the Love Boat. Yeah. Um, how you know what was your role? It looks like it was just um, uh, Becky da Daniels. Yeah, it's really great. Love Boat and Fantasy Island. They had this like this. It was almost like the old studio system. It was almost like a rule in the 1970s, early 80s. If you were on a TV show in Hollywood, you had to do an episode of Love Boat and Fantasy Island. It was like some court ordered program. And it's like, have you done your Love Boat yet? I'm like, oh, I did my Fantasy Island. And um, I, pl I played a prostitute on Fantasy Island. I was a teenage runaway prostitute on Fantasy Island. It was very dramatic. Um, and then I was the Becky Daniels and a particularly evil, awful, spoiled child star, Becky Daniels, who comes to film her show on Love Boat and is horrible to everyone uh, and makes the captain's daughter, the poor little girl, be her stand-in and mistreats her terribly. It was fabulous. It was so funny. It was great. Now, was that was that actually casted on an actual boat, or is it it was all on set? Yeah, when they did Love Boat, ninety percent of what you're seeing is on set. There's like a piece of railing, and bed. back then it was blue screen, it's all green screen, a blue screen with the ocean. Twice a year, twice a year, they would go out on one of the princess crews on one of the boats, and I was always jealous. Like Charo, the actor, Charo always got to go on the boat. Some people, and they would go out on the boat like twice a year and shoot a bunch of episodes. But the rest of us were like, yeah, I don't get the boat, do I? Okay, I have to stare at the wall and go. The ocean looks lovely tonight, but um, but it was still it was it's a fun it was a fun show to do. The people on Love Boat were really nice. Now, so. From Love Boat, Fantasy Island, was, was that also recorded the same thing on the set? You know, Ricardo Montalban, I remember, you know, like a lot of those shows from, you know, that part of my life in the early days. And they were all entertaining. They were all good fun. They were all, they had a moral compass to most of the episodes compared to, you know, to some of the episodes today. It, it's just, it's just shoot them up and slap them with a, you know, with the camera roaming around the place. And it's action, but there's no sequence of morality in any of the programming in today's productions. Do you feel like that kind of morality built into that time period has built, you know, has maintained your actor and a lot of the actors and actresses of that time, they, they just progressed well? I don't know. I mean, Little House, we had a Little House, we had a show where indeed there was a moral every episode. But one of the things that was great about Little House is people would watch it, and unlike, say, well, like Davy and Goliath, where my mother was Davy, that was very, had a moral every episode, but it was very preachy. It was sort of obviously so produced by the Lutheran Church. Um, but whereas Little House, 
people would watch it and they didn't even feel like they were being taught or being preached to, yet they would absorb these wonderful moral lessons from the show. So it was pretty cool. Um, of course, you know, well, in Fantasy Island, I played a prostitute, so I don't know. Um, uh, mind you, though, she gets rescued. Uh, it was a whole thing that her mother has died. And Eve Plum, who played Jan Brady, plays my mother, and she goes into the future and sees her daughter and rescues her. So it had a wonderful sort of happy ending, thank heavens. Um, but, yeah, a lot of the shows, I mean, back then in the 80s, I mean, yeah, there were shows that had good morals, but I can tell you the things that went on the sets of some of these shows were um, just as horrendous as you hear today. I mean, certainly in the 80s, there was a lot of drugs and carrying on. Little House, not so much, although our crew, they were the old school. They were guys who'd come up through Bonanza and then were working Little House. And, you know, they drank. They drank. It was like the TV show Mad Men. They drank and smoked because back then that's what you did. And in the middle of the day, you drank beer and you smoked cigarettes while you were working. And now it would be really weird. Now, if you were on a set and the whole crew was standing there drinking, they'd probably shut the place down. And you wouldn't be allowed to smoke in this, on the soundstage. And on the, the craft services snack table, you would have nice food and you'd probably have organic things and a vegetarian option and a gluten-free option. You'd have some healthy snacks and fruit and healthy things, especially for the kids to eat. Back then, we had coffee and donuts. <laughs> And we had all the worst kind of junk food. And back then in the 70s, nobody thought anything of it. It was a very strange time period. So we're really very lucky as kid actors coming up through that area, era that we're not worse off. <laughs> well, I think, I think you know, like everyone from that era, I mean, you don't hear the same kind of stuff that took place kind of like in the late 80s. You know, the endless... Yeah, the 80s, things got wacky in the 80s. I'll tell you that. I know that they did in a... Um, the rules for child stars were the same in the 80s as they were in the 70s, but a lot of shows didn't follow them. I know that on Little House, they were real sticklers. We had our, our set teacher, welfare work, she had a stopwatch, and she'd say, this child has 10 more minutes of school. And they'd have to stop and make sure that the kid got their full three hours of school. And she would say, this kid's nine hours of work, you know, it was an eight, you know. Four hours work, three hours school, one hour rest and recreation. When your time was up, your time was up, you had to go. And they'd say, yeah, this kid's time's almost up. And it's like, well, how many shots can we get in? And they were very strict about us only working the eight hours, having the three hours school. Absolutely. Being in sight and sound of your parent or guardian. And on Little House, that was serious. And you had your work permit. And you had to keep up a certain grade average. And you had to pass a physical at your doctor's and be in good health. These old people, every six months, had to sign off on your permit. Then in the 80s... We saw kids, and I knew some of these people. I knew they didn't have a C-plus average or better at school. I knew some of them really weren't physically very well, yet somehow a doctor and a teacher were signing off on their work permit. I don't know how. Um, I know they weren't doing the three-hour school on the set. There were people working overtime. There was an era where they got very, very lax about the child protections, and we do see a lot of problems from people who came up in that era. You'll see the, the kids who were on shows where they followed the rules – Versus the kids who grew up on shows where they just decided not to follow any of the child welfare rules. There's a, there's definitely a difference. Now, in one of the series you did, um, you had to cook. In, so how did that help? Did you learn how to cook because you had to, a role that required um, your ability to cook? No, I, I knew how to cook. I was playing a person who couldn't cook. Oh, okay. So <laughs> I got the cooking, reverse somehow. Right? It's hilarious. No, because it was Nellie couldn't cook. The character of Nellie could not cook to save her life. She could she would set the kitchen on fire. She was a disaster area. And it was hilarious because I used to, my father taught me to cook when I was a tiny little girl. In fact, I'm going to be making, I got the turkeys in the fridge. I'm going to be making the turkey and the gravy. Although my husband does this really great Sicilian stuffing. But I make the best turkey and the best gravy. I'm like a fantastic cook. And I was baking and making cakes and pies and things even when I was a little girl. So I get the part of Nellie. Of course, Nellie can't do anything properly. She can't cook. She can't do anything. And they had a, Percival has to come in and show her how to run the restaurant, teach her to cook. And then it's like a miracle Nellie can cook. But when we're doing this, all, all my friends, the director, are all laughing hysterically going, I've been to your house and I've had your cooking. What that? This is hilarious. And then it got even funnier because so many people saw the show and saw Nellie cook that I would invite people to dinner. And they'd say, are we ordering in? Because they couldn't fathom the idea. It's like, no, I'm cooking. They're going, is that a good idea? And then eventually someone would say, oh, for good heavens. No, 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 Nellie can't cook. She's great. So, no, I've been cooking um, since I was six, seven years old. I've been published in several cookbooks. I'm like the galloping gourmet. Oh, what, what is the, what is your, uh, what's the name of the book? Well, several books. There were, uh, there were several 
like collections. There was one for Special Olympics. There was another one uh, where I did baking stuff. It was all these different celebrity collection cookbooks. And I've given them recipes uh, three, four different times. Now I'm working. I'm working on my own cookbook right now, though. And because of the reputation of Nelly not being able to cook, the big line was, "Who's going to do the cooking?" So I'm calling it, "Who's going to do the cooking?" And it's recipes for people who who can't cook or don't cook or think they can't cook. So if you if you're like a Nelly Olson who cannot cook, this will be the book for you. I will tell you how to cook. <laughs> nice. Now. What would be the like out of all the episodes and all the things that Nelly did in the in in the show? What is the character of Nelly that you enjoyed the most as the actress? Oh wow! Well, there's two. The, now my favorite episode, I admit, I admit, it's the one where I go down the hill in the wheelchair. It's called Bunny, and it's the one where Nelly pretends to be paralyzed and Paul goes, "Oh, I can't feel my legs." And pretends to be paralyzed, causing absolute havoc. And then, of course, Laura catches her and pushes her down the hill in a wheelchair. Best episode ever, because where where does that ever happen? Who gets pushed down a hill in a wheelchair? So it's incredible stuff. Um, the meanest I ever was. It's an episode I always think of as the one where even I hate me. There was a little girl who stuttered. And a marvelous actress, Katie Kurtzman, didn't stutter in real life. She was stuttered in the show. And Laura invites her over and is trying to befriend her. And I insist that she say Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers because I have I have a club I'm sure she's trying to join and of course she can't say it she's crying and I'm just sitting there saying I can't hear you say it faster so awful I tortured and mocked a stuttering girl and it's the meanest thing that I have ever done on television or on stage and I think that anybody's ever it was really awful uh I mean as I said luckily Katie and I are still friends uh, <laughs> so it worked out uh, she forgave me um but that was that was bad. I do love the episodes where Nellie got nice, though, when I fall in love with Percival and, and Percival and Nellie fall madly in love and get married and, and I get to change. And that's very rare on a TV show where someone who's such a villain changes and becomes this nice person. So, yeah, that almost never happens. Now, when, when it comes to being the character on these shows, you know, and, and, you're, and you're required to put it, you know, to play the role for the scene, for, you know, for a role, you know, some people may not want to be, a, the you know, the mean person, the bad person, the killer, the such and such. What do you, you know, what what do you say about that when it comes to people taking roles because it's the role, it's not you? Yeah, right. It's those are the best roles too. I mean, good heavens, the 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 villains often have the most fun things to do and are the most, as they say, meaty, interesting roles. I mean, look at look at what happened to Anthony Hopkins, Sir Anthony Hopkins. His career, a brilliant actor, he had not been working that much. His career was starting to go. He did he played a cannibal. He played Hannibal Lecter, won the Oscar, and his career has like been exploding just ever since. And sometimes the villain roles are the best. I've done some great villain roles also on stage. I've played a few nice people, but I admit playing the, the evil characters, it's so much fun. It's sort of freeing. And as an actor, I always tell people it's like you can't you can't be scared to play the bad person, the villain, or show the awful side of yourself. It's being an actor, you need to sort of justify, you have to believe that this awful stuff you're saying and doing is somehow right. That you're, Of course, you're perfectly right. It's perfectly normal to be saying these things. And and it's weird. And then when you watch it, you'll find yourself laughing, going, how could I even be doing that? But it, it, it really, it makes for the best performance if you totally commit to it and you just say, yes, yes, I'm totally doing it. It is perfectly normal that I am saying and doing these awful, awful things. And you believe it. And, and I think that's why there's people who are still scared of Nellie Olson today. I meet people now and they're like afraid to meet me because they saw what I did on the show. Now, when it comes to like playing these kind of roles, just like yourself, how did you, um, how do you recommend to people to build their kind of like specific is, did you convert to in some way mentally when you start a role that is not really your personality? Do you have any techniques or exercises that you do before or during that role in order to get yourself in that scene so this yeah. way you could be that character? Indeed. I mean, they're like standard acting technique stuff. I mean, they talk about and act like they'll say, you know, justification. How did you how did you justify that? And that's when your script, sometimes you may just have an action, something you do in the script and it's kind of silly. And you go, I don't think anybody would do that in real life. OK, well, cook up some scenario in your head. 
of why someone would do that and make it real, even if you go, nobody would do this in real life. Well, they're doing it now, so think of something. And when you're playing someone who is doing some things that you know are wrong, that you would never do, that you would never say, you have to go, okay, flip it around. In what situation would I somehow say this? And that's when they talk about substitutions and they talk about, you know, the whole method acting thing and the who are you talking to? I mean, there are people who have imagined scenarios where you imagine like, well, who is this other person? Well, I wouldn't say that to someone. I'm a nice person. Yes, but what if it was a terrible person? What if it was the worst person in the world, someone you really hated? What if it was someone who was really, really awful? Would you then maybe get mad and yell at them and say these things? Oh, well, that's different then. And that happens. I actually, hilariously, I coached my mother once. <laughs> my mother was uh, auditioning, and it was an episode of a show called She's the Sheriff with Suzanne Summers. And my mother had to play a villain character. She was this terrible woman, who, a little old lady who was a con artist, and she was evil. And she had to punch this guy. And she said, I've never punched anyone in my life, and I don't, I don't play villains. I play the sweet little old lady. And I said, oh, come on. You could totally do this. And we started talking. And she said, how would I punch someone? I said, think of someone you know who's done something really terrible, who's just a terrible person, who's hurt people, who's an awful, awful person, who you would And she went, oh, don't say any more. And I said, there, see, you've thought of someone terrible. She goes, yes. I said, well, close your eyes and think about them and throw the punch. She got the part. So, <laughs> and she did very well at it. And I said, no, it's classic. I mean, these are standard acting exercises they teach in classes, but they do apply. And absolutely. And, and remember, it's not you, because that's the hard part, especially if you're very young on a show and you play the villain because people obviously they have they have with me they will come up to you in the street it's like people on the soap operas i hate you how could you have left eduardo and they like act like it's real and i've had people throw things at me and i have people who are afraid of me and people who said terrible things to me and i'm like wow i must have done a good job because you thought that was real <laughs> like, um so you have to remember they're talking about the character it's not you or you'll you'll go nuts yeah it's Actually, you, you just pointed something out. So when, you, when you're walking out in public and you're meeting people, or you, you're going to conferences or whatever it is you do on a regular basis, and as well as celebrity-related activities, what's it like when you're dealing with the public and how do you deal with the public? Well, now I would say most people are pretty nice and people sort of like figured out the difference between TV and reality. Um, but people who grew up watching the show have a very emotional connection to it and still have that. I remember Nellie Olson being so scary. So they sort of still have it in their heads. And I do sometimes meet people sort of back up about three feet and are frightened. And I have to say, no, really? Hi, it's me. It's OK. Um we were at an autograph show a couple of years ago, and it was several people from Little House. Uh, Stan Ivar was there, and uh, Dean Butler, and Charlotte Stewart was Miss Beetle. And we were all in a little row, and I was at the end. And people would come down the row and look at our pictures and look at us, go, oh, hi, oh, wow, you're, oh, hi, oh, look. And they'd go on, and they'd come down the aisle, and then they'd get to me. And finally, Stan next to me, who played John Carter on the show, starts laughing hysterically. And I said, what? He said, they're coming down the aisle, and they're looking at the pictures and going, oh, yes, it's you. Hi. Oh, yes, I remember you. That was a great part. Yes. You. He says, then they get to you, and they back up about three feet, and they do this. He says, it's like, we're actors. You're real. <laughs> and so people were people were frightened. Um, and so I have to remind them, no, really, it's okay. It's me. Um, and I've had people, I mean, my husband, he's had people say, oh, no, you're married to her. Oh, you poor thing. What's that like? So there are people who still believe, believe this is happening. Uh, I think now, because, you know, what with my book and my stand-up comedy and, and having appeared in enough shows like as me, um, people, most people seem to have calmed down and, and they just say, oh, I loved hating you. Yes, I know it wasn't real, but boy, I really hated you. And I'm like, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, yes. <laughs> now, you, you also had a successful career in, um, in, on the stage and it's, it's specifically in France. Tell us about that experience. <laughs> Craziest thing. So um, I've done theater for years and because you know, my family really started in theater. My parents had a theater in Canada. That's how they met. And I started doing theater. Um, I was like 13 or so. And then um, as an adult, I was doing a lot of dinner theater and around the country, those you know, celebrity dinner theater, you do that a lot. But I was doing stand up comedy. And some years ago and around 2002, I started doing a whole one woman show, a whole one woman comedy show with real stories from my life. And people really love that. And so I was doing that. And then I went to France and I went to France in yeah, around 2002, January. And 
I went on a talk show there just to you know talk about Little House in the Prairie, and that's where I found out the French are crazy for Little House in the Prairie. It's La Petite Maison dans la Prairie, and they love Nellie Olson. And I joke about it. I go, well, the French, they don't think Nellie Olson's mean. They think she's French. Um, <laughs> and so they love Nellie Olson. They love the bad girl. They love Little House. And I had no one. I knew they watched it. I didn't know they were crazy. It was like a cult. They're just mad for it. Now, the French people love Little House in the Prairie. Go figure. And then I went back, and then I met this guy, and he said, we could do, he's a writer, and he said, we could do your American show, but we could do it in French. And I was like, what? And he said, no, no, I'll translate. He said, but yeah, have, we have to rewrite stuff because this joke doesn't make any sense in another language. We have to. And he wrote a French adaptation of my show. And we performed this in completely in French. Him, this guy and myself on stage, we had video clips and special effects and a whole extravaganza in French, this whole comedy review about Little House in the Prairie and about being a child star. And it was a smash. And now my French was terrible. And he'd also never been on stage before. He was a writer, so he hadn't really. So we thought, okay, you've never acted in a show and I don't speak French. And we're, okay. It worked. So I went back to school and learned French. I went back to school. In fact, I have a French, I have a Zoom French class tonight. I mean, um, I went back to school and learned French. He figured out how to be on stage and where to stand. And we wound up doing this for years. In fact, just this last January and February, uh, I was there doing uh, La Malo Trésor de Nelly Olson, sort of the sequel show, uh, Nelly Olson's Trunk of Treasures. It's audience interactive with props and things. And he was writing a third one. Uh, of course, the pandemic hit. We, I was scheduled to be there in September and October to tour the French countryside again. We would do several. I would do several weeks of touring in the spring and again in the fall every year, really, for the last ooh, like 16 years. Um, and, uh, but then of course we, we had to cancel the September, October shows, but, uh, uh, when, uh, things improve, I've got, there's several towns that had to cancel that said, we're, we're taking yeah, the minute things are good. You get over here cause we're putting the show back on. Um, so yeah, um, the French love little house. I performed there live. Uh, I did a movie in France called Le Deal with a famous French director named Jean-Pierre Mocky. Uh, and I did that all in French. So weirdly, I have this whole like second life, this like other career in France. It's the strangest thing. Well, I mean, it's really not in 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 the sense of most of most you know bands tour Europe before they make it back in the United States. <laughs> right, it's the same thing. Yes, yes. It's, well, Eartha Kitt, the famous Eartha Kitt. You know, she came out of you know Mississippi, but the, it was when she left America, she went to Paris and then came back, and suddenly now she was the fabulous Eartha Kitt, direct from Paris. And, and uh, I'm spilling coffee on myself here, but um, yeah, it's the same thing. Eartha Kitt did All Stars, did it. They went to France and came back, and yeah, so I have my European tour. <laughs> exactly. I mean, so your comedy. Tell us a little bit about your comedy. What type of comedy is it, and and how often do you go out? Do you do just the local stuff, or you're traveling? Oh, Oliver, well, up until, you know, uh, the 13th of March, uh, I was touring everywhere. In fact, I had I was uh, performing in New York a lot. I had a gig in New York for May that was scheduled. And uh, I would go all over the country, usually sort of like cabarets, nightclubs, theater kind of places, because it became the one woman show. It was very interactive. We had a Q&A question and answer segment with the audience. And I would actually talk about growing up being an ex-child star and mocking the whole syndrome of, like i'd say well, yeah little house in the prairie no arrests no convictions we're very proud and talking about the french loving nelly olson and all and what it's like to be a child star. and and the whole thing of like oh my god people think i'm really this character you think i'm a bitch and and how insane this is um and talking about that and just making fun of things in hollywood and talking about my real they're all true stories from my life which was fun stories about the show stories about my life stories about hollywood and then we would have a whole question and answer thing where people could send up their little cards and I would answer. And some of the questions were always, it's just really funny and random. Some were about the show. And, you know, I, growing up, I always liked Carol Burnett when she would come out and answer the questions. It was like my favorite part. So I kind of do that kind of thing. And people really like it. And I'll show clips from, I'll show the clips from Fantasy Island and Love Boat and things and make fun of it. Like, oh yeah, here I am playing a hooker on Fantasy Island. Um, and so it's really, really fun. And I was doing that all over the country. In fact, I had a standing engagement really every um, May at the Lori Beachman Theater on 42nd Street in New York. Um, and of course, obviously, all this came to a grinding halt in March. So the guys who booked me into the Beachman in New York said, hey, there's this thing called Stage It. And some of our performers are doing this stuff online. Do you want to do it live? 
pay-per-view, you get paid, stand-up show from your living room. I was like, wait, what? So we set this up, and really was literally just hook up the laptop and set up a backdrop in the middle of the living room and set up a stage. And we did this, and it was great because all the people who bought tickets to the Beachman show, and then we're told, sorry, there's no show, we're like, your ticket is now good. Here's the Zoom link. And it's like the stage. Is and then people were able to get a ticket. And it was great because it's only like 10 bucks. So it's cheaper than going to the club, no two drink minimum. And you can sit there in your pajamas if you want to. And the performer is in your living room. Or as I say, hello, I'm in my living room to yours. I'm in my living room. You're in your living room. And I do the show. And I do the show, and I did, did and I had this fabulous backdrop and everything, and it was a huge hit. We did much, so we did that in May. Uh, we've now done. I did the Halloween one, uh, Nellie's Scary Prairie, uh, Nellie's Nasty Noel is going to be December seventeenth. People get tickets to that, and so now I'm doing the stand up again, but I'm doing it in the other end of my living room with a stage I've created with a backdrop. Um, and then the same thing, I go to all these fan events, a lot of the Little House cast reunions, a lot of just sort of fan meet and greets where they have some people from Little House or whatever. And I couldn't go to those. I had a bunch of those lined up canceled. Ugh. So now I go on Facebook Live pretty much every day and read. I started by reading the Little House books. I wanted something to do. I said, I'll read the Little House books. And then I realized everybody else was home too. So I said, oh, I'll go on Facebook Live. Started reading the books. They went crazy. So now people are going to my little store and they're getting autographed pictures, autographed books, bonnets, tin cups, little house things, autographs, like they would if they were coming up to my table at like after a show or an autograph show, but they're doing it online. And then they're able to talk to me and I'm able to talk to them, answer questions online. Then there's this thing called cameo that a lot of actors do where people say, can you say happy birthday to my mom? And you record a little thing. Hey, yeah, Susan wants me to say happy birthday. So I signed up for that. And everybody wanted Nellie Olson to say happy Mother's Day to their mother. And now, ta-da, here we are, Coach the World. I found out about this thing, Coach the World. And uh, she called me and she said, do you this thing, Coach the World? And it's the videos. And it's amazing. I have had fans say, and they say, sometimes they want to know something specific, like acting, and they'll say, well, it's like a coaching thing. And, and many of the people want to do acting, coaching, or coach in other fields. Sometimes they just want to talk. I, I, I've i had people come on and they're like, do you have pets? And I'm like, yes, here's my cat. And they're like, here's my dog. And we had, there was a girl in Japan and she signed up for a coach the world video. And she was in Tokyo and we were talking. I said, are you in Tokyo? She said, yeah. She said, you know, I have to run out, <laughs> get my mail. And I'm like, wait, can I go? She's like, come with me. And she takes the, because it's all on the phone. She did. She went outside. I got a walking tour of Tokyo. She's like, and here's here's where I get my dinner. Usually. Here's the liquor store. Here's the super. Here's where. And she gave me a tour of her neighborhood in Tokyo live, which I mean, I haven't been to Tokyo. So I thought, wait, who's having more fun at this thing, her or me? Um, and she got all her questions about Little House in the Prairie answered. So I'm now able to talk directly and interact with my fans, even though I can't get on the plane and go see them and can't, you know, I I go to the post office, I go to the grocery store. <laughs> um, if I can't leave and they can't come here and we can't, the events cancel because it would be all these people jammed into a theater or crowded space, we're able to talk to each other now via the internet. It is genius. And I have been camped in my living room now for the last several months, yammering away on the computer and the, and the phone. And it's actually worked out really well. So coach the world is definitely a favorite. I yes, it's great because it's as I said, it's well, here you are. It's like, look, I can see you. You can see me. You can see my books. You can see the cat. That's it. Um, and if I spill coffee on myself, it's fine. I'll rinse this out later. So, <laughs> um, it's great. In fact, okay, so tomorrow's Thanksgiving, and I'll probably do like a Facebook Live when we take the turkey out of the oven. It's like people were. I got more people participating in what I'm doing in a way, and coach the world like with the fan events like the the big autograph shows with the big ones where they charge like a lot of money they would charge people a fortune for like a personal meet and greet and for less than you would pay for that you get literally i mean like the cameo stuff sure you get a recording hi yes happy birthday but this is people get to ask whatever they want and and i feel like you're right here and people get this connection with their celebrity and some of the people in coach the world uh are celebrities and some are people who are experts in their field and people are taking classes online. I'm, uh, I took a Tai Chi class. I'm taking a, another French class. Um, people are taking classes online. Here you can now get experts in their field who normally you would have to travel great distance and sign up and pay a bunch of money to be in some you know hotel ballroom and have their course. And you can 
at everyone's convenience of time of day, set it up in your living room, and there they are one-on-one, -on -one, and you can say, okay, look, I'm working on this. How do you do such and such? And there you are, and you have your coach, your own personal coach in your living room. It's, it's a fantastic idea. And then with the celebrities, like I said, for the fans to now get to talk personally one-on-one, -on -one, I, I think it's a great idea. Well, that's pretty awesome because now you can just put it on your resume, coach by. <laughs> coach by. I actually did coach. This is the craziest one. You know the comedian, um, Rich Little. He was the big, the, the big impressionist. He'd been around forever. Um, he's still alive in Las Vegas, still working. Eighty move. You know, he's in his eighties. Never stopped working. He was doing four nights a week at the Tropicana in Vegas doing his show. Well, of course, they had to shut everything down. And he was going out of his mind saying, I, I got to perform. I can't stay home. I have to perform. What do I do? And they said, well, we got to do one of these internet online shows. And he said, I don't know how to do that. I've never done that. So they called around. And next thing you know, I get a phone call from my publicist who says, okay, Rich Little wants to perform. And his people just called and said, didn't Allison just do one of those online shows? Can she help? Next thing I know, I'm on the phone with Rich Little. And he said, yeah, what do I do? I said, well, Remember in the old days, we would sometimes do those comedy shows where they didn't have a studio audience, like talk shows, and you'd fake it and you'd do your act and they'd put it in later. Yeah, they... It's a lot like you're performing to an empty room again. And he's like, oh, I can do that. And I was like, yeah, it's the same kind of thing. And we talked about it. My husband and I wound up going out to Vegas, staying out there. He has a very, his living room is, you know, size of an airplane hangar. He's a very big living room. So he had his little stage up here where there he was with his stuff. And he, he did his Johnny Carson impression with his big Karnak, the Magnificent Act, And the camera was here. And then we had a couple people in the room seated like 10, 15, 20 feet away. And he did the show. And he had a guy, a really great tech guy, had all set up and broadcasted out on stage. And he even had special effects where he, he does uh, paintings and drawings. And they showed the paintings. And it was incredible. And it was great because he got a whole new audience because, you know, a lot of his crowd – who come to Tropicana were older. But all these young people who are used to going to shows on the internet tuned in, and they many of them are quarantined with their parents or grandparents, and they said, hey, Rich Little is now on the internet. So they bought tickets for their parents, and they all sat down together and watched Rich Little show. So he actually broke out into a whole new younger audience of on the online people that would not have come to the Tropicana and he got to continue to do his show from the comfort of his living room. And so I was I was basically his internet performance uh, coach. There you go. <laughs> now, well, all of these pieces combined, I mean, equals, you know, services of all kinds. So that is that right? is just an amazing thing. Now, when when it comes to like you also part, you know, you also have a charity that you're a part of that you do stuff for yeah. for charity. Well, tell us about that charity. Yeah. I've always done something. I mean, when I was a kid on Little House, we would always, and we had toys for tots, we'd go help out with Special Olympics or any charity. I was always into that. And, you know, a lot of actors, when they're on a show, their publicists will make them go to some charity event, and they may not go again. They may say, well, that was fun. But, and I was like, can we go again? Can we go tomorrow? Um, and I liked that. I said, wait, I can use this Nellie Olson thing to, like, help people? Wait, that's a good idea. I want to do that. So uh, for years, I started, I was with uh, working with Age Project Los Angeles. I did the comedy stage at the big uh, summer party fundraiser for Age Project Los Angeles. I was on the hotline, worked at their food bank. I did a lot of education about HIV and prevention. And, and then for the last several years, I've been on the board of a group called uh, Protect, or the National Association to Protect Children. I'm president of the board currently for protect.org and you can go to protect.org online and see what they're doing and not only have we changed laws to better protect children's abusers um we have the hero Corps program where veterans often veterans who may have been disabled and are looking for a new mission a good job because they can't go back to their old jobs and we train them and hook them up with the internet crimes against children task force the police because who needed more manpower so we're helping the police who are going after the child traffickers, the people who abuse children and photograph and all those guys. So we're and we've it's resulted in more arrests and the rescue of many children. New project, literally just starting this week. I just had them on my internet show, the Allison Arnhem show. Uh, a foster care program. Kids in foster care, when they turn eighteen, they're done. Now, some foster parents treat them as their own children and say, well, are you planning on going to college, dear? And let's make sure you have a job and we're get, where are you going to go after you leave here? 
some foster care situations are not like that. And thousands and thousands of kids, when they turn 18, simply leave the house and are thrown into the street. Like 20% become homeless almost immediately, and another 20% become homeless in a few years. Thousands of foster kids turn 18, they don't have a job, they didn't make plans for college, the foster parents just didn't even bother, and said, well, you're 18, you need to get out of the house now. And they have nowhere to go. And people have been trying to, at different from different angles to approach this problem, but Protect came up with a plan. Uh, one, it's similar to a Habitat for Humanity type thing of building housing for these kids, but in a wraparound with social services, mental health counseling, because many of them were in foster care because they were abused and removed from their homes, they had PTSD, job counseling, educational counseling. They're looking at having housing like near college campuses, encouraging them to continue their education, encourage them to get employed and mentorship, people who from the community who can talk to them about, yes, you, you can have a life, what would you like to do for a living? What kind of jobs are you interested in? And actually mentor these kids and get them off the street into actual decent, clean, real housing uh, until they can get you know work and education and have their own place. And it's a fantastic program. Literally, we're just starting it. Uh, probably the kickoff will be in Atlanta, and they're already meeting with people in social services and in construction and in housing in Atlanta to start this program. Now, do you do you have a coaching program? I, I mean, Coach the World is kind of like your your spot where people can be coached by you. Right. But do you actually do you have a program organized specifically for people who want to be short and coached for acting or any other services that you are you know sure. promoting? I haven't yet. I mean, I've done, as I said, some some coaching. I, um, I know when I was speaking at a lot of conferences about AIDS and about child abuse, I've spoken on a bunch of different topics. And initially, I took on Coach the World. It was really more to, well, if a fan wants to talk about Little House in the Prairie, and they can. But absolutely, there are people like, well, since I have you here, if someone says, well, I'm, I'm in a play, I'm starting as an actor, and I need to play a villain, as we said. Well, what, what do I do? And I've certainly had friends come to me with that, like, okay, I actually have to play somebody really objectionable. I'm not really sure how I do this. And I'm like, I, sure, pull up a chair. Um, so absolutely, that's totally available to do that. I mostly, as I said, the fan meet and greets, but I've had people want to talk to me about just about anything. And uh, I think it's great, and I'm willing to do that. Do you have a website, uh, a central location where all of your, um, you know, social structures are there where people can buy your books, connect, buy your products. What is the website? Well, everything. I've got the main website is bonnetheads.com because we like to call our Little House fans the Bonnetheads. Bonnetheads.com is my main fan website. I do. There is an allisonarngram.net, which is like my business site, which has links to absolutely everything. And, of course, I'm on Facebook all the time because I have the Facebook Live, the Al Allison Argo on Facebook, which has links to the store and everything else. But there's links to everything on bonnetheads.com or allisonargram.net. Well, that is awesome. Is there anything else that I should, that the people really should know about you? I mean, you've, you've been everywhere. You've done a lot of stuff. And sometimes, <laughs> sometimes, you know, people interviewing celebrities may not find that little thing that you really want to get out there and say, hey, you know, this is something important to me that I would like people to know. Well, I'm very happy about Protect. It's like visit the website protect.org and see all the stuff they're doing because it's massive, massive stuff. And then the new foster care thing is huge. So check out protect.org. I'm doing that. So you got Cammy, we got Coach the World. Uh, I have stageit.com. Next show is December 17th. I have my store, which is uh, Loose Gravel on uh, productions on Square. Square, you know, where they do the, like, the credit card thing. Square.com is my stores on there. Um, and then Facebook Live, I do my readings. And then I have my show, The Allison Arngram Show, Tuesdays at 5 o'clock. Uh, World AIDS Day is coming up, and we have several AIDS researchers will be on. Uh, so I interview people. So I do that as well. Um, it's it's pretty bananas. I'm kind of online all the time. Uh, and I like all of it. And I really can cook. And I'm making a turkey. Uh, <laughs> I got sweet potatoes I'm, I'm baking right now. Um, I guess what's left is, is, yeah, I do all of these things. And I really thought back in March, that I wouldn't have anything to do, that I, I would be totally just sitting in my living room doing nothing. And the opposite has happened. I am busier now than I've ever been. And I did do a lecture for a, a business conference in Ireland that I was going to fly to, but instead wound up doing for my living room, that was about reinventing yourself in the midst of a crisis. 
And that's something I've done over and over again, where things have changed. And I said, well, I guess I have to change everything and adapt to this now. And so here I am now uh, adapting to this. And then, of course, as I said, I have the book because uh, uh, I did write my autobiography, Confessions of a Prairie Bitch, which was quite successful. And I've had friends, I have friends who are writing autobiographies. I have one friend who's working on his autobiography right now who's been sending me chapters and going, hey, you know, am I doing this right? What should I be looking for? So um, I, I, I keep saying I'm not really the foremost expert on any of these, but I have done several of these things, like reinventing myself over and over again, fairly successfully, and I'm absolutely willing to share. So when it comes to, let's say someone is writing a book and they're stuck and they don't know exactly whatever, they can log on to Coach the World. Dot com absolutely and get some advice from you specifically on that specific topic absolutely they're having writer's block we can bounce some ideas off i can tell them what i did when i had writer's block they can tell me where they're going with it and i could yeah absolutely we'll knock it around and see if we can't get you going well on that note allison allison arngrim thank you for taking the time to to be with us on uh, leader cast here in, in in tampa located in tampa do you fly to tampa for anything yeah. on a regular basis I or you're in been florida to tampa. i have been to tampa i have been to orlando um where else have i been i think i was only oh i only got to go to st petersburg briefly but i did get to spend time in orlando and i have indeed been to tampa it's a lovely place well you know 2021 will do it'll be i believe it's in um june the first the, the first week of june we'll have podfest multimedia expo which is one of the major yeah. podcasting conferences in the world an international podcasting conference which i'm a part of and i will i'm i'm either doing something there producing stuff editing stuff creating stuff you know or at well at, the allison Arthur show is an internet radio thing and we do it facebook live but it rolls over onto stitcher and itunes and all the podcast services so I should, I should, I should come to that. <laughs> Absolutely, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, introduce you to Podfest Multimedia Expo, and I'll cool. send you the links and stuff. So this way you Thank can get you. um an introduction to it, and we'll see. Maybe we could have something, Little House on the Prairie Day, or or, I a, think you or a segment of something like that. <laughs> I'm, I thank you. That's great. Well, actually, thank you very much. I'm Anthony Kovic with Leadercast, and uh, we'll see you on the next episode. All right.